Hi, this is Pastor Jeff from Community Covenant Church, and I'm glad that you can join us for our Sunday message on uh, this June 13th, and uh, we're glad to have you. So as we start off here, I was wondering if um, you've ever been pulled over by a police officer for, you know, getting into some situation and then been able to talk your way out of a ticket. I have not actually talked my way out of a ticket. Some I've had a couple occasions where the police officer has been gracious and given me a break. Um, and then I've had the times where they weren't so gracious. <laughs> but it's interesting, the stories that people go to to explain themselves and why they aren't guilty for things. And it shows up more when they're turning in something for uh, an insurance company accident form. Um, a number of years ago, the Toronto Sun newspaper printed some samples of actual reports that people filled out about a auto accident they were involved in. And uh, the lengths people go to claim that they weren't responsible is really something. So here are a few of them. A pedestrian hit me and went under my car. So the pedestrian hit me. It wasn't my car hitting it. In my attempt to kill a fly, I drove into a telephone pole. I'm not sure if that was effective in killing the fly or not. I had been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. Okay, that sounds like it. <laughs> it's likely. Um, here's one. I had been shopping all day for plants and was on my way home. As I reached an intersection, a hedge sprang up, obscuring my vision. I did not see the other car. A pedestrian. The pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran him over. Yeah, probably served him right. The telephone pole was approaching fast. I was attempting to swerve out of its path when it struck me. Oh, so it was the telephone pole that was coming. Here's one. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that I don't have. <laughs> the guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. My car was legally parked as it backed into the other vehicle. Uh, how does that work? Here's one. This is good. An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my vehicle, and vanished. Oh, there you go. The invisible car ruse. That works every time. And how about this one? The indirect cause of this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. I think we've probably experienced that little guy in the small car. You know, it is natural for us to try to squirm our way out of things, to come up with an excuse why we are not guilty, why we're not to blame. But the truth is we're all guilty of sin, or more accurately, we are all guilty of sin. And that's why forgiveness is such a big deal and is so critical and is such good news for us. So we are in the home stretch of our series on the Apostles' Creed that were titled, We Believe. And these statements of faith that are listed. These are key statements. And as I've said before, they are like the load-bearing walls in a building that are so important. If you remove any of them, the whole thing collapses. And that's these statements of faith that are so key to the Christian faith. If we don't hold on to them, then our faith just crumbles under us. So we need to understand them and we need to believe them because they are so critical. So as we've done each week, we are going to say the Apostles' Creed together, and hopefully you're kind of learning this by heart um, by the end of this series. Um, and also let me just say, if there are any parts of the Creed that you don't understand or you missed that uh, message, you can go back on our Facebook or YouTube page and you could find that message, and hopefully that'll be an ongoing resource for you. But let's say the Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So today we are at this phrase, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Now when we examine this, I think the first question that is natural for us to ask is, what are we talking about when we say the term sin? Forgiveness of sins. What is a sin? Well, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that is used, that we translate sin, is chata. Now, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. But the essence of what that word means is to miss the way, to go wrong, to incur guilt. And it is talking about either people willfully doing this or even accidentally doing it, but they're going against God's moral law. And that is chata or sin. In the New Testament, which was written in Greek, the word they use is hamartia, um, which is technically an archery term. And it means to miss the mark. So you're aiming at the target, you miss it, and they call out sin because you didn't hit it. Here is God's standard of moral perfection. And when we don't meet that, we don't reach that, we are guilty of sin, whether we willfully chose to ignore it or whether we just accidentally did. In uh, the catechism questions that are learned in confirmation, the definition of sin is all in thought, word, or deed that is contrary to the will of God. So whatever you think, whatever you say, whatever you do that isn't in line with God's will and God's moral standard, that is sin. My simple um, word phrase that I use for definition of sin is just self-centeredness. It's me wanting what I want when I want it. And if you get in my way, then you're going to pay the consequences because I am number one. In other words, it's saying I am God. I have my way and everybody else can just hit the highway if it's not my way. Think about any sin that comes to mind. And I'm, I guarantee you can trace it back to self-centeredness. Somebody is murdered. It's because I didn't like that person. They hurt me. They deserve it. I've decided I'm judge and jury and executioner. Um, lying. It's because I don't want to be embarrassed. It's all about me. I want to get away with things. Um, stealing something. It's I want that thing, and I don't care if I don't have the money or somebody else owns it. It is all about putting yourself in that place of, I'm the most important person, I'm the center of the universe. And it's interesting also to think about how um, it is the same original sin that the angel Lucifer, rebelling against God, wanting to be equal with God, was cast out of heaven and Satan and those angels that were fallen angels. That was that what they were guilty of. And then in the Garden of Eden, Satan tempting Adam and Eve to eat from that tree that God had said no, because his motivation was you will be like God. You will be equal to God. You'll replace God. The results of that Entering into the DNA of humanity is that everybody has it since then. Every single person, as I've said before, we're all born physically alive but spiritually dead. We have this brokenness because the results of our sin being a part of who we are is that we have a weakening in ability. We have broken relationships, first of all, a broken relationship with God, but also the broken relationships with other people because of sin that we do or they do. And then it also means that we'll have a weakening ability to obey God. If we allow sin to reside in our life and we practice it, we're going to have less and less ability to to do what's right. We're going to be more and more a slave to it. 
And finally, it leads to eternal separation from God. That's the ultimate negative that can happen. Um, and the reality is that we're all guilty. Like I said, we're all born with the sin DNA in us. And in Romans 3.23, Paul writes, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. God's standard is perfection, and nobody makes it. Everybody is guilty of falling short. Even the best of people, the Apostle Paul, acknowledges his own struggle that he's had. He says in Romans chapter 7, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Ugh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Boy, can you relate to that? Can you think of those times where you're just like, man, I just can't get out of this negative spiral of just being a sinful person. I'm trying. I want to do this. My motivation is there, but I can't do it. And then I end up doing the same thing and I hate myself. And it's just like, boy, I want to just give up. But Paul goes on with a little glimmer of hope in the next verse where he says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. No matter what our motivation may be, we still can't do it on our own. But the answer is in Jesus. We need a Savior because we're helpless on our own. And in Romans 6.23, he spells it out. He says, hey, the wages of sin is death. The things that you earn for what you do, just like wages in a job, is death. You deserve it. Rightfully, that's what we deserve. But... The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the gift of forgiveness. Forgiveness, which means that our debt is canceled. Jesus steps in and says, no, I am taking it. I am purchasing your freedom on the cross. In Colossians 1, it says, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. And then in chapter 2 of Colossians says, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature it was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. God does what we can't. He is the one who takes care of it. You know, let's, let's be serious here. Let's recognize how severe and serious sin really is. A holy God cannot ignore sin. He cannot be in, allow sin to be in his presence. It has to be separation from his holiness. And he can't simply ignore it or just say, ah, it's no big deal and I'm just going to tear it up. No, it is sin is a capital crime that deserves the death penalty. In the Old Testament, God, in his mercy, provided a way for the Israelites to experience some forgiveness through the sacrificial system. You bring an animal to die in your place. And because of that, he was able to allow that forgiveness to take place for that sin. And relationship with God was able to be restored, but it wasn't a permanent fix. That sacrifice for that person's sin was okay, but then the next time you sin, you got to find another animal. You got to go through that sacrificial system again because that was an imperfect answer. God's ultimate plan was to provide the perfect final sacrifice that was needed, that would take care of the sin problem once and for all, and that was through his son Jesus. Our forgiveness is only possible because of Jesus' willing but horrific price that he paid on our behalf so that our debt could be canceled, so that sin could be dealt with once and for all. Never take it for granted. Never lose 
your understanding of the amazing love that Jesus demonstrated for us to make it possible for us to have our sin dealt with and forgiveness to be complete. Because it is complete. Because of Jesus, our forgiveness is set in stone and it is complete when we come to Christ and allow him to do that transformation of our life. In Romans 8, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. We are freed from this penalty for our sin. We are no longer condemned. Even though Satan, who is also known as the accuser, is really good at making us feel accused and guilty and that we should be condemned. Now, whenever you feel like it's too late, I'm condemned, there's no hope for me, that is never from God. That is from Satan. It is a lie because there is no condemnation because of Christ's forgiveness. Being freed from slavery to sin means that we can then have more power to stand up against sin in the future. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the ability to make a choice in a way that we were not able to apart from our relationship with God. When we were still uh, far from God, we were just slaves to sin and we didn't have a whole lot of ability to stand up against temptation. But now, because we are God's and we have new life in Him and He is within us, the Holy Spirit empowers us to have resistance to make that choice to stand against temptation. Now, let's be honest. Do we still sin? Do I still sin? Yes. There are times when I give in to sin. Um, And that's just because I have not been perfected yet. You know, God is working in me. God's working in you. And we are becoming more and more submitted to Jesus and his power and his presence is being a part of who we are. But the perfection of that, the final solution of us no longer having any temptation, no longer ever giving into sin, is only going to happen when we are fully transformed, when we are in Jesus' presence, either when we go to him at death or when he returns and restores everything to the way it should be. So, we're never condemned by God, meaning he's never going to use our sin against us and say, hey, I've kept this list of all these things you did. Remember when you did that? Yeah, I'm I'm still going to hold that against you. No, we've been forgiven. It is complete. He will never condemn us. But the Holy Spirit within us will convict us of sin for the purpose of getting us to confess it and to be restored. Here's the difference. Condemnation means you're condemned. It's over. There's no hope for you. You are guilty and you are now headed to the chair. You're gone. It's over. There's no hope. Conviction is saying, I, there's something wrong. I feel and I'm acknowledging and I'm recognizing there's something I need to do to make this right. And so you come clean and you go to God and you confess it and then you choose to repent, meaning stop going that way and I'm going to start going God's way. So conviction leads to a change. It leads to us coming to God and saying, hey, I confess, I'm wrong and now I'm going to choose your way. The good news in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. God is ready to forgive us every chance and every opportunity that he has and every time we need it. So we have this great gift of personal forgiveness, but you know what that means? It means that we have a responsibility as well. Every Sunday, if you're in person worship with us, we pray the line, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. In Colossians 3, Paul writes, Since God shows you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. 
Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Our new life in Christ means that we have experienced forgiveness and we've adopted into God's family and God is within us, but it also means that God is at work through the Holy Spirit making us more and more like Jesus. And if we are more like Jesus, it means we're going to demonstrate the characters, characteristics of Jesus. And so, like this list, we will become more merciful and we're becoming more kind and more humble and more gentle and more patient and more forgiving. We are called to forgive those people who have sinned against us. But, you know, that's tough. I mean, think about who has hurt you. Who is it who has offended you terribly? The person that just came to mind, that is the person you need to forgive. But but that person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. Yes, exactly. But but that's not how the world works. You don't just forgive people. Yeah, exactly. It's not about being the way the world is. It's about being the way God is and the way God's people are. Forgiving is not easy. Man, I won't pretend that it is. It is the work of Jesus in us. It is supernatural. And because we have God within us, we can do the things that we can't do on our own. And you know what? We are never more like Jesus than when we forgive other people. And we want to be like Jesus, right? So let's talk about forgiveness. First of all, just a reminder, forgiveness is not saying that what that person did was okay. That what they did was no big deal and just, ah, yeah, whatever, I don't need to worry about it. No, a lot of the things that people do to us are horrific. They're terrible. In some cases, they are really, really, really bad and really hurtful. So forgiveness is not saying it's not a big deal. Forgiveness is also saying, is not saying that, hey, you're going to be restored and you're going to be hanging out with this person. You're going to be best friends. In some cases, in a lot of cases, it's probably not even a good idea. You don't want to be with a broken person who will hurt you again. You want to be wise. But in some cases also, it's not even possible. Maybe that person you need to forgive is not anywhere near you. And maybe that person has passed away. You still need to forgive them. So forgiveness is not saying this. What is forgiveness saying? It's saying, I will not hold this against this person moving forward, and I will not use it against them. And saying, here's my list of all the grievances that I'm going to bring up every time, and I'm going to keep on using it against that person. Saying, no, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to give it to God, and I will no longer hold it against them. And I'm also saying that Jesus' death was enough to pay for that sin, that horrific sin they did to me. In the same way as Jesus' death was enough to pay for my sins that I did to God and I did to others. It's a hard thing to think about. But you know what? The bottom line is that forgiveness is for our benefit. It's for us to be free from self-inflicted pain. You know, when we hold on to a grudge, when we refuse to forgive somebody, when we say, no, I'm not, I'm never going to forgive that. And we're hanging on to that and we're allowing bitterness to grow in us. It is self-injury. We are hurting ourselves through that. Now, somebody said, choosing to be bitter and hold a grudge against someone and not forgive is like drinking poison with the hope that it's going to, the other person is going to die. But we're the one doing it to ourself. In Ephesians 4, Paul says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Max Lucado said, this. He said, forgiveness is unlocking the door to set someone free and realizing you were the prisoner. 
Forgiveness is a blessing to us. When I choose to forgive, that's for my benefit, first and foremost. I need to experience freedom for myself. Jesus has offered us forgiveness to free us from our sin and the penalty and all the negative stuff that we carry when we are guilty. We can be forgiven there, but we maintain our freedom by not allowing us to be enslaved with bitterness and unforgiveness. We're, we've been free. We're instructed to keep remaining free by being willing to forgive others. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. For myself, thank God, thank the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness I have through him. But also, I believe forgiveness of sins for others that I will not hold it against them. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this amazing gift of your forgiveness. Thank you for the difference that that makes for us and allows us to be in a right relationship with you and to allow you to fill our lives and to transform us more and more like Jesus. Oh, but God, you're also calling us to not hold on to grudges against others. You're calling us to forgive other people who have sinned against us no matter how terrible and extreme that sin against us may have been because you desire us to be free. You desire us not to be weighed down with bitterness and allow that to destroy us from the inside out. But instead, you want us to live lives that are free and empowered by you. So thank you for what you've done for us and help us to choose to step into the freedom that you want to give to us as we forgive others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this this can be really tough. And I want to acknowledge it. I mean, I've had experiences myself where I held on to grudges and it, it uh, was not a good thing. And years later, when I finally went through this process and forgave people that hurt me, I experienced this freedom that I was like, why didn't I do this years ago? That's what God wants for all of us. And if I can be of assistance and help as you struggle and work your way through this, because it is some work, but it is doable, please reach out. Let me help you through this. Um, I want you to experience freedom as God intended for you. So God bless you in this coming week, and I pray that you will experience the fullness of the blessings of forgiveness for you and the freedom that God wants to give you as you offer forgiveness to others and not hold on to that bitterness. God bless you, and have a great day and a great week.